get thumbs up when we're set up. Yep, we're, we're pretty much set up right now. Oh, excellent. I can just start this PowerPoint screen share when you're ready. Yep. So would you, uh, since we have incredible Joseph in the house, uh, should we do a quick uh, tour of Paula and then we introduce Joseph and get right in? Is that okay? Uh, should we start? I know the table and come on. Sure. Uh, I'm Swati Chaudhary. I'm in the Innovation School at UNC Advisory. I'm Laura Schur. I'm with the Innovation Facility at UNC. I'm with the Bureau of Management Services at UNC. I'm Pratika Harish. I'm also with the Innovation Facility at UNC. Uh, and I'm Carl Gray, uh, and I'm with A Tech. I work with and for Joseph. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit more about what we do and how we can potentially uh, provide some good value. Fantastic. So I'm Malika. I work with the Innovation Facility. I'm a coordinator here at UNB. We're going to introduce him shortly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm Niall McCann, the lead electoral advisor at UNB. We're also working, beginning to work a little bit more now with country offices on national identity. I'm Andra, and with the International Partner for Agriculture Program at the UNBP. Chris Murray, I'm working on the SDGs, particularly on the Gulf 16 production. Hi, I'm Vicky Gupta, I'm with the Moody Office of the UNBP. I'm Patrick, I work at North Carolina Mission under the Invest Finance Portfolio. Hi, I'm Laura Kyle, I'm with the Strategic Policy Unit at the UNBP. Wonderful, welcome everyone. Um, so this is the incredible Joseph, who is the CEO of ATEC, and if I'm not mistaken, ATEC is the first company to provide blockchain technology uh, for international aid. So we're very excited to learn sort of the 101 maybe of blockchain sure. so we can all be on the same page, and then about your use cases and your experience going sure. forward. Um, should I yeah, yeah. Um, that's your side of Great. Do we have people online? We do have people online. We have um, people watching. And then I think we get more and more as they come on. So you can do it from here. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to go. I will. That's really cool. <laughs> that is amazing. I'm going to try that. That's not blocked. That's really cool. Right. Oh, yeah. It's Tuesday morning. Kind of a Star Trek type approach. So I'm just like quick doing it. Okay, guys, do you prefer if I stand or if I sit? I guess I'll stand up easier to see everybody. Um, hello to everybody watching. So, my name is Joseph Thompson. I'm the CEO and co founder of ATEC. We have a brief background on myself and a brief background on why we started this and where we are now. Um, so, background studying software, computer science, master's in strategy, and MBA. I'm studying the world's first master's in digital currencies. Um, my background has been predominantly in strategy consulting in the banking sector and the telco sector, and mainly in the Middle East and Sub-Saharan African countries. The reason why I wanted to provide a service and solution for this sector was in 2009, I ran the Marathon de Sabra in the Sahara Desert, which is six marathons, six days in the Sahara Desert. I raised a lot of cash and donated to a charity. My main donor asked me about nine months later where that money went, I went back to my charity and see if the money went where it was supposed to go, and it didn't. Uh, so that always just stayed with me for the next four or five years. I really wanted to see solve that problem. We didn't know how. I didn't know what how, what the solution was. And then through the wires, I came across blockchain technology and this new decentralized technology can add transparency, efficiency, and traceability of the transfer of funds, but not funds, but goods, and so on. Um, so with that, in 2014, I came to the idea to say, right, I'm leaving the bank. I'm working at a bank in Ireland. I want to create a solution but for the banking sector, but go the absolute opposite way for the one to two billion people who don't have any of these products or services. Um, when we looked into the humanitarian sector, we saw there was very low barriers to innovation, there was very high barriers to the sales cycle, and so on. So with that, I got a team together, and we built the technology over the next nine months. Then I went back to my donor of the initial fund in 2009 and said, hey, give me some more money. I've got a technology that's going to solve the problem that we encountered in 2010. And he said, no. And I said, give me the money. 
I'll partner with an aid organization. If I lose any money, I'll be held accountable for it. So then we partner with the Irish Red Cross for the project in Lebanon, which I'll discuss towards the end of the presentation. So that's kind of the reason why we got into it, my, my personal reason. Um, so let me start off. Okay, so our vision is to increase the transparency and efficiency of the distribution of funds and social services by government and NGOs. And what we mean by that is it's not just distributing cash, it's distributing goods such as water, blankets, food, absolutely everything can be traced. And then when you get people on people onto the system, you can distribute social welfare services going forward. So it's a, it's it's as the Federation of the Red Cross says, we're giving them a backdoor to a new financial system that they control. Okay, so that's kind of what our vision is. And why we decided to do this, um, we wanted to, I'm not sure whether that's happened because it's PDF, so I shouldn't have it. Um, so the team is, is myself, Carl's the chairman. Carl is famously got involved um, in blockchain technology in 2009. I kind of stopped him for two years, basically. So I wanted to come on board and help us make this a real world uh, application. Um, once we have a real world application, we believe that it can be rolled out massively on that scale. Because we're not a business and we can't scale, then we come from the truck. And that's like not to help anybody in our case. Um, so, some people consider blockchain technology the missing piece of the internet. So, if you look in the early 1990s, what the internet did for information was democratize information to everybody globally or set us on the path. The way we look at blockchain technology is democratizing finance for absolutely everybody. So, just working with partners like yourself and creating these applications it gives everybody access to financial products. They may not have access to banking, they may not have access to any identification, any documents, any land rights, and so on. And we believe blockchain can actually change that. Change that. And that was the reason why we wanted to do this. Okay. So recently, the World Economic Forum announced that 10% of products um, and sold around the globe will be on the blockchain. And you can see now the amount of investment, especially happening from the Valley to New York, that's going into blockchain startups. We see them going into blockchain startups for financial sector and insurance sectors, not so much in the humanitarian sector. And that's an area that we really wanted to address. Okay. So, hands up. Anybody want to have a go about explaining what blockchain is? <laughs> okay. Um, so, according to the Bank of England, the blockchain is a technology that allows people who don't know each other to trust, um, or just to trust a shared record of events. What we like to call it is permissionless trust. So you don't need to know the person that you're dealing with, but there's no incentive for you to defraud each other. So if you can imagine everybody who's here is working on an Excel spreadsheet at once, and you're all typing the entries and that and so on. As soon as you enter something, that's available for the whole world to see, but nobody can go back and change that information. So if you can imagine that in transactions, as a transaction, that the transaction happens on the blockchain, which I'll explain later on, that information is sent for the whole world to see, but you don't know who that person is. Which, so you can't have fraud. You have instant transparency, you have traceability, and you have efficiency. Adding efficiency to the distribution of paying products and goods helps lower cost and makes more money guess at the end beneficiary. So that's a very, very high level of what the blockchain is. Any more questions on that? Because it's a it's not an easy thing to understand. In a sense, it's called a decentralized ledger. So that means once a transaction is sent from me to Carol, it sends everybody else in the room to see that transaction. So you can't have double spam happening in that transaction. Now, if we bring it back to the distribution of, say, blankets or clothes or medicine, that can only be distributed once to one person. And that same transaction can never happen again, which means the project we can let on the Red Cross and my donor could see those transactions happening in real time. So you can't have fraud. And I'll explain this later on, but every single cent of that project was accounted for in real time, although we encountered fraud, which I was very happy to see, because he, as we say, you can't be fraud in that Okay. Anybody want to ask any questions there? Just, uh, back, I just to throw in please. something there. So I'm not as smart as Joseph and the rest of the team. So when I encountered blockchain uh, for the first time, it was very much a, okay, this sounds like really nerdy technology stuff, which is not my background. But the way I've come to think about it is from the beginning of time, Every interaction between two people has required a level of trust. They had to have some facility that prevented them from 
mistrusting each other and therefore not entering into a negotiation or conflict. Very early on, people decide, okay, in order to have that level of trust, we're going to have some central authority, whether it be a government, a bank, a police force, some kind of regulatory body that people have trusted, they will guarantee that nothing is fraudulent in the transaction. That's that's great. That works really, really well, but it comes with a lot of inefficiency. You have to have people, technology, cost, all of these things. And in our in the you know in the developed world, that's not a problem because we've got very established economies and we can afford those kind of costs. But it means that a lot of people get left behind. If you're in the developing world, if you're a migrant farmer, or if you are you know, just moving into new governmental jurisdiction, you don't have access to credit. You don't have a credit profile. You don't have access to insurance. You don't have access to all of these centralized, trusted entities. Blockchain provides an ability to conduct transactions without the need for that centralized authority. So it's peer-to-peer -peer transactions in a perfectly non-corruptible, non-fraudulent uh, way. So that people can have absolute trust in the transaction without having to necessarily have trust in each other. So I, I have a question, maybe. Sure. I mean, maybe we're going to deal with it later. So what we're assuming is the veracity of the source that, you know, it's uh, a government we trust, it's an entity we trust that's entering information. So when you come to things like land rights, you know, it's first mover advantage. Is it sort of who has access to the blockchain first? So can a government go in and like, I own all of this land and I can kind of sell it off? Um, and because it sort of captures that, you know, how do you correct for um, those sort of entries into the blockchain? Um, we'll answer them as we go through. So it's based on digital identity is the first piece and everything comes on. And the services, but please feel free to ask questions as we go through. Okay, so as Carol has explained there, blockchains are record of events. So if something happens on the blockchain, it's there, it's immutable, it's there for all time. Now, what we're going to look at today is three points here is digital identity, asset management, remittances, and some other services that we're actually working on at the moment. Digital identity is absolutely core to what we do. Where digital identity, it's a once off transaction that may happen, such as the distribution of aid and refugee camp and so on. So anything that contains information can be saved. So the blockchain is basically once something goes into the blockchain, it's saved in the blockchain, the next block is created and the previous block verifies the next block and so on and so on. So everything is saved going forward. So you can't corrupt anything in the past. And that's the beauty of it. Okay, so any of that information is saved. So land registry, Micro insurance, microfinance, and all these services can be built upon once the digital ID is there for the end beneficiary. Just, just one quick point as well. We, we mentioned this before some of you joined. The fact that it is a perfectly distributed network means that how the reason blockchain can't be corrupted is if you have a traditional database, you it's centralized. So you hack into where it is and you change the information. With blockchain, the information is distributed all over the planet. Not only would you have to hack into every node, you would have to hack into every node at the exact same time to change the information. And with billions and billions and billions of transactions happening every second, it's just not possible. And so any block on the chain that doesn't have a verified set of transactions immediately is flagged as being not synchronized, not having the right information. So the network effect actually verifies the entire chain. And until you sync up with the latest version of the blockchain, you're no longer trusted. So the network basically regulates itself. It doesn't require any human interaction to regulate it and to verify it. And with that, the blockchain is the world's greatest, largest supercomputer of all time. So for eight organizations, using the most powerful computer network ever can almost cause benefit price where it's basically almost free. And that's the power of it. And that's where we come in to offer these services that let you utilize this technology. Okay. So we'll go through some of those examples now. We kind of covered this, so it's a distributed ledger technology. This is what some people call it as well. Um, 
shared ledger is distributed all over the world to participants to make sure transactions can be changed from third, uh, third vendor parties. Um, so just basically, once you send a transaction, it's sent it to absolutely everybody on the network. So when you come across blockchain, you hear called DLTs and so on. The British government, their chief scientists, said the power of DLTs last year, so the power of blockchain in one of their annual reports and come to you some people. So applications for humanitarian sector, and this is the services that we provide at the moment. Um, so what's absolutely core and key is the digital identity. Um, we spent a couple of weeks with the Federation of the Red Cross in Geneva discussing this, and we'll control their projects for actually over there next week or two. Um, and we actually are going to roll out some projects with your colleagues in Serbia. So maybe I think it's the head of innovation and um, border of Turkey and Europe, and then with Ramya. I think this is his name, and we're looking at doing a project there in India. Uh, and what will be absolutely core is registering people on the platform so you have a digital identity. That digital identity means they have, one, an identity on the blockchain so they can travel across borders and so on, but two, they can have different services added as they grow in the economy, as they grow forward, creating a credit profile. They have this identity that will call them everywhere, it has all their transactions and all their credit history attached to that credit profile based on their digital identity. Um, we are actually, at the moment, speaking with the European Commission. The European Commission have a competition called the Social Innovation of the Year Awards. 1,100 people applied. We are actually in the final 10 for our solution to integrate refugees into European society. Um, and we go up to Brussels and we present in front of the Paris of the in Europe at the end uh, of the month of September 27th. And it's based on this. If you can imagine a refugee traveling from Syria to Germany, which may be a pregnant, it's going to be a very different experience of a teenage boy from Pakistan to Sweden. So you're almost customizing their experience as they move into the economy. So while they're waiting five to 17 years to get identified into the economy or registered as an asylum seeker, they have to build this credit profile, all based on digital identity. And all these other services can come on to digital identity, such as health, and education, and so on. Perhaps we're going to speak to this later, but how do you ensure the privacy of the individual who is being registered on these platforms as the yeah, that's a great question. So that was something we took into account when we were creating this. When we were working with researchers in Cambridge in the UK. We will adhere to the standards that the aid organization has. So it's the UN or the Red Cross. We're not going to create a standard that says this is the best way to use it. Now what we've built into our technology is if everybody in this room has a digital ID and you lose it, it's only going to work with verified vendors that the aid organization says can work. So in worst case scenario, if somebody's coming from Syria and they use their identity, Somebody from ISIS or somebody from Assad's regime finds us, can they pull that information out of these persons? The answer is no. So we let the aid organizations control who can actually verify that information. And the information on the individual is not up to us to hold. We let the aid organizations decide on that. Yeah, that's something that's quite important. Um, so you can see the digital identity is the core piece of absolutely everything. Okay, so we can work across borders. Reduce the needs for migrants registering each uh, crossing. So, you use an example there in Europe. Um, and so associated with this would be the next part would have digital assets. So, the example would be a pregnant woman traveling from Syria could have very different customized aid to somebody else traveling in that journey. So, this is probably where the magic happens on the system. So, asset management means we give aid organizations and government a platform that they can control the distribution of aid. So that could be cash distribution, as it would be the project that we're going to do in Serbia for remittances, or it may be the distribution of seeds and agri products for farmers that we're going to work with in India. So we create an asset, and it's a finite amount, and then we can distribute them to people on the system. And that way, the aid organization has control of what's distributed. So in real time, they can see what's being redeemed, what's not being redeemed. There's, there's no need for anybody to defraud each other, because it's impossible. But the aid organization is distributing Bottles of water, blankets, cash, whatever it may be. So you can imagine that somebody has their identity, and the identity acts as basically key their bank account. And they get their assets sent to this bank account. So they can travel anywhere with them. They just have a simple plastic voucher, you can have a mobile phone, and as they travel, they're bringing this bank account with them everywhere. Any questions on that? Please. How do you prevent 
couple of things that are important to realize here. I, what is identity and what is digital identity is probably the $64 million question of our age. And when we set out, we decided we weren't going to try and come up with a definitive answer as to what is a digital identity. The reason for that is it's a very ongoing, evolving concept. Because your digital identity is more than just your biometrics or your address or, you know, your age or your job or your education. It's a very, very all-encompassing thing. And depending on the agency that you're interacting with, so for example, if you are dealing with a humanitarian organization such as the Red Cross, you may be arriving in a jurisdiction and you need immediate emergency help. You need medication, food, cash, whatever you need. The Red Cross is going to require or need certain information about you in order to receive that. But then as you move along a journey, let's say you land in Germany and you start, maybe you enroll in school, maybe you get into a social housing program, they're going to maybe require different information or overlapping information uh, to what the Red Cross captures. So this idea of digital identity is going to morph and change and grow as you're interacting with these various programs and agencies and things like that. Each agency has a long track record in what fields and requirements they have. So again, we didn't want to come along and say, okay, Red Cross, UNDP, um, you know, all these different organizations, here's what you need to capture. Because you guys have a lot more experience than we do. So we, with the blockchain, there is the ability to basically capture infinite amounts of information on any one person in an encrypted, secure way. So we will provide the ability to capture the information and then we work with the aid agencies, the NGOs, to say, what do you need for your particular program or programs? Now, how do we make sure that, that person is the person that's being presented? Well, there's a whole host of ways to do that, from biometrics to you know, very simple passphrase or PIN or so depending on the actual risk of fraud. So if it's somebody who has their identity stolen. Then you know we can introduce things like biometrics and PIN, you know, two-factor authentication, things like that. To a limit, it gets a little bit more complicated when you actually have voluntary fraud. So somebody is saying, "I'm actually going to share my benefits with some other people or sell my benefits to other people." Um, but there's ways that we can get around that as well, such as the double spend. So preventing people from actually double spending uh, their benefits. So, and, and we'll go through that a little bit more, especially when we talk about the um, Lebanon project. But we, we do have solutions in place to actually solve that, depending on whether it is involuntary fraud or voluntary fraud. And we'll, we'll go through that a little bit more in a few minutes. So, that's just an example over there in the asset management. So, let's NGOs, aid organizations, create whatever they want to distribute and can trace in real time. 100% transparency. So, you ensure that the end person gets to it. And remittances. So, your colleagues in the UNDP, uh, Millie and so on, across in, uh, Turkey, want us to go down to uh, do a project in Serbia. And we've been working with local government there. And it's basically in Serbia, they have up to four billion dollars worth coming in from the Sporia, but they don't have to distribute it evenly. If you look at where the money's coming in, it's causing local inflation. Um, and the people are supposed to get the cash from not getting it in real time. Okay? So by creating an application, a platform, an asset you can distribute, who should get that goes back to they have an identity, you can trace them and you can see where it's going and make sure people are falling below the poverty line and the poverty tracks. So for example, if someone moves away to America and he sends the money back to his family, he needs to make sure that his mother gets that money so she can buy electricity, food, whatever it may be. Um, so basically, the government in Serbia, and it's in a city called NIS, NIS they want to have traceability and transparency of how they're distributing aid in this particular city. They know they get a lot of cash in, but they don't know where it goes and they don't know how it's being used properly and so on. So from a government point of view, it, it maps the money trail. Okay? And with this it's a seamless integration too. So it has an ID, they're getting money sent into them. Okay, can they use that to pay for health, education, different medical aspects and so on. And it's quick and easy onboarding of local vendors. So basically, we give the power to the aid organizations and the government bodies who verify who they want to work with. So if you look at it in a separate way, it's almost like selling a supply chain. 
say, hey, the first time I've used this, you can control the distribution of whatever you want, even though I've already got in real time. What's the end user adoption rate for this? So which pregnant women are, are using this, and what do you see the trajectory of that adoption? So we are working with the Federation, uh, the Dutch Federation of Red Cross, and we're looking to all our projects down in Haiti and South Africa, and they will be not so much for refugee integration, but will be the distribution of remittances and food security. So we're looking at two projects there, we're looking at 25 to 30,000 people, and there'll be bigger projects where we can scale up. So we that we don't say what the adoption rate should be, we work with the aid organization, but they determine where they want to roll the projects out. So is it just the aid organization that needs to be able to receive and send in blockchain, or do you foresee individuals um, and vendors where you're buying food, right? It's yes. ultimately it's about the person. So the way we look at it first is, so we're a business to business office, so we go to the aid organizations, and we see them as channel partners. So we don't see aid organizations as paying clients. We see governments as paying clients. The aid organization gives access to the end users. Okay, so the people who need aid, social services, will register with the aid organizations, and that gives us access to the end users. We have actually developed an app, which I will discuss later on, and this app will basically allow you to top up the app and say ten dollars and in that ten dollar on your app you can say i'm going to buy four boxes of oil two boxes of oil or two bags of rice and then they can distribute them to local distribution centers in a separate country from a selection of aid organizations so that's getting to the level of individual transactions from a donor to a recipient now we're about six months away from releasing that but before we wanted to do that we wanted to make sure we have a relationship with the aid organizations yeah, yeah, it, ma it makes sense. I'm just pressing from the, let's say, let's say you've been hit by a disaster and you need aid. So you go to, just mapping out the journey of the, of the end user, it's, it's probably the hardest thing to connect from all this theoretical talk, stuff we're talking about to somebody getting food and shelter. So if you've been, let's say, victim of a disaster, you go to your aid organization where you normally get food, which might be your government or it might be a Red Cross. And there they sign you up for a digital ID. And they give you, let's say, a bunch of blockchains. Or do they send you over to a store that takes blockchain or but cryptocurrency, which is enabled by blockchain. How does it work? Like, how much financial freedom does the user have? Um, what are what is what is their behavior look like? And are we opening up their behavior? Or are we restricting their behavior? So, Not giving them cash. So the whole goal here. So one of the, the most common mediums of aid in the world today is cash, mm -hmm. and the reason is it's fungible, it's quick, and it can be used everywhere. What we want to do is maintain all of those benefits, but then solve one of the biggest problems with cash. If I put $10,000 in cash on the table and walk out of the room and come back in five minutes and it's all gone, I don't know where it's gone. I don't know who's taken it, who they've given it to, what it's being used to purchase. So there are big, big, big problems with cash. What blockchain allows us to do is have all of the benefits of cash with a minute level of traceability. So you can factor, you can find out exactly where every micro cent of that is going. Now, how does that benefit and how does that work for in the real world with the beneficiary? Let's talk about a disaster scenario. I, I believe we have someone from the climate change area here. So we just had a recently a disaster in Haiti where you had people who were just, their entire community was decimated. In a scenario like that, there's two ways to approach it. You can try and be preventative, but the major problem there is it's going to cost an enormous amount of money and you never know if it's actually going to happen or when it's going to happen. So you have to stockpile, stockpile, stockpile. The other option is you jump into action after the fact, which means you're losing a lot of time, a lot of efficiency, 
and people are already hurting. With blockchain technology, you have the ability to implement something called smart contract. Now, in reality, what that means is, imagine a scenario where the blockchain was tied into meteorological information. So all of a sudden, the blockchain is notified, there's a storm coming, and it's going to be really large, it's going to cause a lot of devastation. You've already registered beneficiaries on the blockchain. They already have either a plastic voucher, or an app on their phone, or a physical voucher. It doesn't really matter what the medium is. As soon as the blockchain receives that notification, it can trigger and send funds, assets, whatever the case may be, to all those beneficiaries instantly. So all of a sudden, their cash card or their app or whatever is loaded with the cash or the access to blankets or medicine or whatever they need. If, now here's where it gets really cool. Supposing the winds change or for whatever reason the storm does not materialize, that smart contract on the blockchain can be notified of that change and immediately pull back all the resources. So imagine if you had all of the benefits of being able to roll out cash and real-time resources to people, but then if it didn't happen, recouping them wasn't an issue. That can all happen today. So simple APIs connecting into the blockchain so we can trigger all of these events. So whether somebody gets a cash payment and then they go to a store, how we can actually do this, when they get the cash payment, they get a notification maybe on a phone app or a text message, an SMS message saying, you've received X amount of dollars. And not only have you received those dollars, but we can tell from the GPS in here where you're at, and we can tell you where you can spend those and what you can spend them on. We're actually partnering with a company out of uh, Sweden called Mobilar who specialize in their case, it's with refugees, but getting information into the hands of people about what benefits and what programs they can actually access. And so the goal is to be able to have people not only get them registered on the blockchain, but then use that to get information to them. Not just benefits, but actually information. So we can tell them, okay, you're in this jurisdiction right now. That means you're entitled to sign up for these programs. And that's what it, here's what it means for you in reality. So these smart contracts are very, very powerful, and they actually have a degree of, I won't say artificial intelligence, because that's an overused word, but they can dynamically change and route resources to people and actions based on real-time events. So I, I know it's kind of a huge, huge encapsulating answer, but, but that's how we can actually get aid to people, resources to people in the real time and not just give them the aid, but actually show them how to properly leverage it. So what stores they can go to, what products they can buy. Down the road, it's gonna be even possible to give them price listing and say, listen, we're not just giving you cash, we're actually gonna tell you where the cheapest place to buy your food items are, based on your shopping habits. So we can actually start to build a profile around somebody's um, behavior and then benefit them and give them information based on that. A follow up to that. Um, it sounds like this would work best, for example, if someone has a, a some sort of phone or technology associated with their digital identity. And I know that certainly, you know, they've sort of exploded and are a bit of a game changer in the developing world. But like, is there like what is the penetration rate of phones versus you were sort of saying using a, a pass or something? Because I imagine in Haiti, you know, not everyone is going to have a phone. Um, so. The only person who needs a phone is a shop vendor. Okay. So if the end user has a QR code in their mobile phone, it's an app with a plastic card with a QR code on it, that's the, the bank account, that's their address saved on the blockchain. So it really doesn't matter what they use. So the project in Lebanon, we use specifically use plastic cards okay. because we kept having electricity credits. We wanted right. to work in an environment where you can actually work online and offline. Yeah. So we'll go through that later on. And we come back to Carl's point. And that mitigating against national disasters is called uh, basically finance-based based forecasting. So you can distribute aid, or you can actually revoke it so the money's not lost in vain. At the same time, not taking away any rights of the individual or the end user. So control is always with the aid organization. Okay, and we have actually a diagram of that we can show you at the end. Sorry. Yeah. So especially when you don't want complex emergencies. So it's a marked by the disruption of communication systems. 
So, I mean, how do you like disseminate information in such cases? Sure. Also, uh, what is the level of user preparedness? Do you like give training to the users? So, I, I'm not going to steal Joseph's thunder, but just in terms of how long it takes to wrap somebody up onto this system, from a very cold introduction to a vendor, so there's two parts of so there's a vendor and then there's a beneficiary. We were actually able to get a vendor who had never heard of blockchain technology in Lebanon from cold introduction to actually processing transactions on the blockchain in about seven minutes. With a translator. From With a translator. <laughs> yeah. And not just an Irish accent, but a Dublin Ireland accent. So it would be more complicated. But so from the vendor, about seven to ten minutes. From the beneficiary, it was even faster. We basically just told them. This stores your benefits on it, and you just hand it to the shopkeeper. And then they maybe told them how much was on there. And again, that will vary slightly depending from program to program, whether it's cash based, whether it's food based, whether it's medical based. But we're going to partner with the aid agency in each specific case to do a train the trainer type program. Because again, those the NGOs, those aid agencies are already subject matter experts in their specific programs. The whole, the whole idea of aid tech is to basically sit between the ultimate beneficiary and the program provider. So that we're helping facilitate that relationship rather than coming in and changing it or you know, dictating what it should look like. Um, we, we obviously want to keep all of the benefits in play, just make it happen quicker and faster and cheaper. I missed you a quick time check of about 20 minutes. Sure, yeah. So this is the main bulk of it. So okay. we were creating it was to do with the IEB, the asset management unit. This is the rest. It's, this is the core of it. So just give you an idea. Okay. Some other parts I can go on micro insurance. So we're actually speaking with the UK and Ireland's largest insurer next week. And um, we had conversations with USA about basically we have that in the blockchain. So if somebody has an identity, and then they get subsidized by the local government and they have micro insurance. They can actually take a picture of their deal, take a picture of their lifestyle, send that picture off to insure was working with the government to come back with a quote. So this person may have no bank accounts, no documents, but now they have a micro insurance policy saved and their ID saved on the blockchain. So what you're doing there is you're building resilience for people. You're giving them the opportunity to build their own future as opposed to receiving handouts of aid. Now they're insuring their future. Well, what comes from that then? micro pensions so people can actually start saving for the future because they have a level of security behind the insurance again transaction costs are low all the information to save in the blockchain let the individual in the world's most secure largest network and there's an example of a wrap so this has got some attention from insurance we we'll talk about this and this is a prototype that we have so it's, it's not Hopefully, finish for about six months. Um, it's the idea that you can take a life insurance crop animal, or you can mitigate against weather. You take a picture of whatever it is, and then if you send that picture off, and the local government sub or aid organization subsidizes this, that's your monthly cost, that's your service, whatever it may be. Um, still to be finalized, but that's the idea. So we're working through these tests and saving this information on the blockchain. Again, keep saying it will go back to the person's identification. So they're building this credit profile as they grow within the economy. And then the very important part of this is logistics. We don't see ourselves as a blockchain company. We don't see ourselves as a humanitarian company. We see ourselves as a data logistics company. Because we're guaranteeing data from one part anywhere in the world to the next part, between two parties who may not know each other. And it's the movement of data, but it's protecting the end user's identity, who they are and what access they have to these financial products that they have never had the opportunity to have before. Because they're left behind by the banking system, or they're left behind purely because they don't have access to documentation, they don't have access to land registry, and so on. All this connection chains up for developing economies. Okay, so as I say, it's logistics, it's transfer of records, data, it can be used in absolutely anything. We decide to use the humanitarian sector. But again, if you could move that towards the commercial entity. If you think of an aid organization who's delivering food on a truck for a disaster hit the area, and that truck is stolen or breaks down, you have GPS on that truck, you can say, okay, all these products are in this truck. Let's reroute. What's the next best option to get this information? We can get these products to these people. And that's all based on the information that we save on the blockchain. So the aid organization and government can say, 
Maybe we have this information, these products, they have not been delivered. And we can prove that because it hasn't been delivered or guaranteed on the blockchain. What's the next best option? And this goes back to efficiencies to help make the organization become more efficient. Any questions on that? And we've touched on this already about climate events, so what we like to call forecast based finance. So you know the disaster is going to hit. It's going to hit in 72 hours. Everybody had this register on the system. You can distribute aid at the touch of a button. It can be water, food, cash. Okay, that disaster hasn't hit. Let's revolve all those transactions because the smart contract will allow execution. Or water may need to hit a certain level, and then once that water hits, then we can distribute the aid. And that's on the blockchain. So you can't have any falsifying of information. Okay. This may be a bit hard for you to see, um, but it's basically what Carl was saying earlier on the smart contract. So it's a contract written on the blockchain to make sure if a weather event happens, you can make that distribution happen, whatever it may be, the aid organization will decide. Um, so an event like the likelihood of a monsoon happening in Dakar triggers the execution of distributing that aid. We're actually speaking to the German Red Cross about this in Bangladesh. We know the disaster is going to hit the next two months, but how bad or how many people are going to be affected, not exactly the targets quantified. Um, so, I'll go back to the second part that we mentioned there, creating these digital assets. The digital asset may represent 100,000 bottles of water. We have 10,000 people there, and we can distribute 10 bottles of water each. So these people now have these vouchers in their pocket. They go to a local store, they know they're entitled to 10 bottles of water. And the permissionless trust between the vendor and the end user means that they get back to those products. One of the real powerful things of this, again, is how this smart contract can dynamically change based on moving events on the ground. So nobody can predict the weather or change some weather. It can you know, try to forecast it, but based on the whole series of events, it can alter. So you can actually dynamically route resources based on real-time changes in the, in the situation on the ground. And, and not just climate-based. It could be war, conflict, anything like that. One of the final pieces there is land registry. This is actually a very easy thing to do. So basically, a coordinator, as I say, it's data is the representation that goes into the blockchain. So the person has an identity, you have a micro insurance, they're building a credit profile. Now you have, you can say, so I'm not moving off this land. This is registered to me, subsidized by the government, and here it is to create some blockchain. It's forever there. So you're giving people all these access to these different financial products that they never had before. Um, so I won't go into that in too much detail, but it gives that access. So it's based on documentation that's saved onto the blockchain. So that's kind of the theory and the, 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 the products that we have and what we've built. So in Lebanon in 2015, so it's back to mentioning earlier on, I went back to my donors and said, give me $10,000. We distributed the aid to 500 Syrian refugees on the border of Lebanon and Syria. Um, we got the Red Cross to set up everything on the ground because we're not the experts in this. They got a community center, and it was mostly women, it was about 90 percent women um, who were looking, they were hustling for, for more vouchers, for more credit, and so on. And we went to the shopkeeper, and it was verified with the World Food Program. He said, you don't accept these vouchers. The shopkeeper had a $60 mobile phone, with a QR scanner on the phone, scanned the QR codes, it opened up a web page, and he just confirmed the transaction. That was sent to the blockchain. Within two hours, we had 44 fake vouchers come in. I mean, perfectly copy fake vouchers. It took me three days in Dublin to get these printed, and we got them in two hours in the refugee camp. I never found out how they got them done or how they got them made. But once you had the transaction that happened, once it was confirmed, anything that came in that was copied, it didn't matter. And they were scratching their heads. See, how did we not beat this system? It really didn't matter because we could tell when and how it was used and what person and so on. So the donor and the actual Irish Red Cross in real time can see every single cent of that distribution of aid being distributed. Fairly uneven. And for the shopkeeper, he knew that he, when he had a simple web page that says your 500 vouchers have been redeemed, he knew the reconciliation of cash was due to him. Because he had got fake vouchers in before from World Food Program. When he went to redeem them, they said, We only gave you $2,000 worth of food vouchers that day. He said, Well, I gave you $6,000 worth of food. And the discrepancy there, he couldn't tell in real time what he what was real and what was not real. They had holograms and everything like this. But we say you can't do fraud mathematics. And um, that project was absolute success. That was the first time ever international aid was committed. For that project, we didn't use people's IDs because it was a once-off distribution of aid. We've since done a second project in Ireland with 800 people who are homeless 
and women from the traveling community. Um, the reason we don't, we don't publicize this is because St. Vincent and Paul is Ireland's oldest aid organization, or oldest aid organization, I should say. Um, they give women cash on a weekly basis, but the men can take that cash and go drinking in the pub. So we took that cash away and gave it to former vouchers. The women went to local charity shops and redeemed for clothes for the kids and so on. Now the reason we're not the public slides up because it paid some people in the back and they buy and so on. And again, every single cent of the money that was distributed to 800 people was perfect. There's no fraud, there's no cash being spent in pubs and so on, there's no bank. I can actually have this, I can share a video of the project um, it's a two minute YouTube video. Um, and this is just how it works very basically. The end beneficiary would register with an aid organization. And then the shopkeeper, everything is basically distributed uh, via mobile app or whatever it may be, person's identity, they're registered on the system. So every time a transaction happens, it's sent to the blockchain, so it's secure. Everybody can see a transaction happen, it's a long line of code, but nobody knows that text means. Apart from the aid organization is controlling distribution. Shopkeeper then basically redeems it in the store and the product goes to the beneficiary on their hand. But we like to call theirs permissionless trust because the shopkeeper, there's no incentive for the shopkeeper to defraud the beneficiary. And likewise, because the, if you can imagine that the beneficiary is passing over this identity and information, and that's being removed from that person's voucher to the shopkeeper's wallet, which is on his mobile phone. That wallet is being controlled by the aid organization. So they can see in real time the distribution of products, the distribution of aid, and what products need to be replenished in local stores and so on. So that's where it brings in your efficiencies in the supply chain. Okay, so there's just some facts there we discovered. So vouchers were all redeemed, $10,000 to make Syrian refugees. And this project actually has got us into the finals of the European Commission Social Innovation of the EU because we built on that the identity where they can actually have a credit profile based on identity as they integrate into Europe. And that was again with the same thing as St. Paul, so distributing aid to homeless people and women from the traveling community. So our team, myself, Flavian, is ex-Microsoft engineer. I think he's the best blockchain developer on the planet, personally, and I do mean that. I think he's way ahead of his time. Now as our COO, um, Professor Konstantin Gurdjieff actually is lecturing in military university on the West Coast. Uh, and then Carl is uh, the guy who got into this before everybody else. Um, we have some great advisors as well. We have Julio, I believe he used to work for UN, uh, UNDP. Um, Marco, um, so all these guys. This gentleman here, Danny Curran, he's fantastic. He supports us from the very start of the Irish Red Cross. Um, and he's actually got us meet with the guys in Geneva. Okay, so we're for a load of awards. So the European Commission is the big one, which we want to win by the end of the month. Um, we're for Innovation of the Year awards last week. Unfortunately, we lost the MasterCard. Um, I think it was a fix, to be honest. <laughs> uh, Europa's awards for startups. And next, this Friday, I fly back to London to pitch to the Duke of York and the Royal Family, um, which is quite interesting. Um, I don't know how I got myself in front of royalty, but whatever. <laughs> Um, and there's some more partners. We've just come from the US-based accelerator at Techstars. And um, we're on Mass Challenge in Massachusetts. Um, we're for IBM and UK government as well. Yeah. So there's some of the guys we're working with, the Federation of the Red Cross. So I think, Carl, you're going over to Geneva in two weeks' time to finalize where we'll be working on the project there. Yeah, they've got, uh, it's been kind of interesting because we said, OK, We'd love to roll out some projects with you guys. Say, Great, we've got projects in 191 countries. We said, okay, well, let's start uh, prioritizing and, and what we need to do. Because when people start to really see the potential here, it just explodes very, very quickly. I mean, as just mentioned several times, identity management is the hub of the whole thing. And then we have all of these ancillary services that we can hook on into that. So really, as we spoke with the other Secretary General of the Red Cross, Dr. Mahmoud, she said, "In a lot, you know, for us, day to day, we take our identity for granted. We just know that we have an identity. We have proof of address, births to be all these things. There are so many people in the world that don't have that, and that locks them out from so many opportunities. And so the Red Cross really wants to help everybody on the planet have the opportunity." to access their identity in some way. 
so they can leverage these services and programs and benefits. Are you done now? Literally, one or two more slides, I think that's it, yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. 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 Um, if I understand this correctly, from as long back as we care to remember, identity is something that the government gives you, right? The Irish government says I'm not a can. I can't run around saying my name is Carl Gray, sure. Because why would you want to? Why would you want to? <laughs> and, and no matter, and we all exist digitally now, we all have Facebook profiles, or we even sometimes have the fake names, we've got fake. So we kind of exist in a digital sense right, as how we want to be. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, only states confirm who you are, right? And in fact, something that would be really important to you, like sexuality or God knows what, the vast majority of states, they just don't recognize. Yeah. They say, no, you're male or female. Right. You, or in some countries, like this four-year delay in Afghanistan to roll out the project because the government wants to tell people you are this particular ethnic group, whether you think so or not. Sure. Um, if I understand correctly, this blockchain technology is a kind of a, an alternate sphere where someone can exist digitally without having to depend on state-given identity. And, uh, uh, and to, to, to clarify the question more, for example, when someone, when a Syrian refugee does turn up on a beach in Greece, and they do not have any identity documents at all, and because they've lost them, or they've stolen, or they've deliberately destroyed them in some cases, which they may be incentivized to Is it from that point on, you can enroll someone somewhere digitally on a blockchain, and from, from that day, we're now saying, digitally you exist from this point on, and that's the person you are, and that's the person we're going to build this profile of you on. Sure. So, so, so that goes back to, no, that's <laughs> perfect. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about this question of what is your identity is the $64 million question of our age. Because you're right, historically governments have said, this is your identity, and no matter what you do outside this box, this is all we recognize. And various governments, the box is a lot bigger, a lot more liberal, some it's very, very small and confined. What we're saying is, we want to help create a situation where somebody can leverage all of the benefits of whatever their government recognizes without necessarily inhibiting them from leveraging other resources. So if somebody is escaping a dictatorial regime where either their sexual or religious or ethnic rights are not respected, they should not be restricted to what that government says they are. So if they arrive in a jurisdiction that's a lot more liberal and wants to provide them a lot more resources, that government may say, you know what? We do recognize your sexual orientation. We do recognize your religious affiliations. And we're going to help tack on those pieces that your government doesn't recognize. So we're going to take what they do recognize and we're going to tack these on. So now when you're in our jurisdiction, you can benefit from these programs based on that information in addition to what you have. So it's about building the identity rather than just saying, nope, that's what it is. That's what it always will be forever. So, because people have historically been limited to you know what the jurisdiction says. Now, we're not saying that we're going to go around governments or bypass regulations or anything like that. We're obviously going to work within the realm that the person finds themselves, which is typically a geographic jurisdiction. So, if they are in Germany, Germany has a constitution and a set of laws that say, here's what we recognize, and here's what that entitles this person to receive. So it's just basically, the idea is to help people take what they have and add to it according to their needs. Now, a couple of really quick add-on examples might be, for example, you mentioned the whole idea of somebody being incentivized to destroy their identity documents. Now, there, that, you could have a very innocent reason for that. They might be escaping a regime that is not very, you know, not very nice to them. And they just want to say, listen, I just I don't want to even be affiliated with that. I want to pretend like I'm from a different country. So in that situation, that's going to be a government decision. Each government is going to have to decide how to handle it. We're simply providing the technology to facilitate that decision. If it's somebody who actually is trying to destroy their identity for a nefarious reason, 
So we have this whole concept of lone wolf, right? People entering into a jurisdiction under false pretenses. Well, how our solution benefits that is, if somebody comes in and says, you know what, I'm 30 years old, I have four children, one of my children has diabetes, another children, another child has autism, and we need access to all of these aid programs and educational programs, if that person gets into the country, and again, coming back to smart contracts, if they're not fulfilling the actions that that profile would indicate they need, we can start triggering flags and saying this person is not behaving according to the profile that they have volunteered. And so there's a national security and safety aspect to it as well, which is very beneficial. Um, so I, I know it's a, it's a concise answer. It probably doesn't answer all the aspects of your question. But. So I know we have uh, two questions online. And perhaps we can collect a couple of questions before we wrap up. Is that OK? Sure. So we have a couple of questions. This is from you and women. Um, are you working with local authorities to verify information going on the ledger? And the second question is, do you need internet access to input transactions on the ledger? So the first part is that not yet, but they're on our radar. Thank you. Uh, first part is yes, we'll work with local and security. Um, second part for that. Second, uh, do you need internet access to input? So, ideally, yes, but transactions can actually still work offline. So, there's these small computers called Raspberry Pis. They're like forty dollar, twenty dollar machines actually. So if the internet goes down like we did in Lebanon, transactions can still be backed up onto Raspberry Pis via Bluetooth or even Wi-Fi when it comes back up. So the aid worker can sync up those transactions to the blockchain later on. We're actually working to ultimately we want to have this solution work seamlessly, whether there is power or data connectivity. And we're working with some alternative energy providers to bring in uh, some green energy backups, um, but the thing to realize is blockchain technology is so efficient, it can actually run perfectly on a 56k modem, which there's probably a lot of people in this room that as old as me. That's what we used to, you know, sit there and wait for the AOL dial. You don't need high speed internet, you don't need very complex infrastructure. Um, you can actually, as just mentioned, use these little Raspberry Pis that can store the entire blockchain on them. So imagine having an IBM Watson data center in a tiny little corner shop in Bangladesh. That is the power that you can leverage for next to no cost. And the transactions are as far as text data. So it's not media, it's not very Hi, yeah. Um, I used to work for the land registry in Rwanda and Ethiopia. And uh, the issues they had there was government failure to transact that. The whole point of a land registry is the robustness of the registry. The, the government guarantees that. So if I understand correctly, just building on this one, basically the blockchain will be coming in as a replacement for the government clarifying, sorry, um, guaranteeing the robustness, and the blockchain, the power of the community, will guarantee the robustness instead. Now, so in other words, it's, it's providing an informal mark, land market, but it's, but it's formalized because people trust it. Yeah? Now, my question is, when you're replacing a government service service, and as a country it evolves economically, and you say eventually after 10 or 20 years, you know, the, the government can guarantee the robustness of the land registry again, and know what is better, how can you make that connection back? Or, or would your argument be that you just never would? That, we, that actually the future is this. So my question to any government that would try to decentralize that, or try to centralize that information again, is what's your motivation to do so? If you have a perfectly decentralized, uncorruptible data source, why would you want to revert it back to a centralized, corruptible data source? So they would take over, they would become part of the blockchain. Yeah, they, they could certainly administer access to the data source and see and divide up views into it, but Again, the question, if anybody is saying, well, we want to have this just a centralized database that we can corrupt and change or modify. Yeah, but also land registries are an autonomy, you know, autonomous organization. You're supposed to be getting money back in and stuff like that as well. You know, so maybe it could be revenue streams and they need to connect that 
But they, but they would they have would access. Have. Yeah, they would have access. They'd be able to hook into the blockchain and get all that information. Anyway, they just wouldn't need to necessarily control the information. It's like the government of Dubai last week announced that they want to save 25 million um, civil servant hours per year for 2022 by having all the government documents on the blockchain. So that doesn't manipulate anything, it's just going to be more efficient how they transaction their data. I know people have got to go. It's a very brief question. Fascinating stuff, and the way in which the, the financial transactions are, are smooth I think is um, invigorating. But um, equally, I can see that there are risks and other things that you're going to be wrestling with. And that example with the fake vouchers, there will be a, you know, a dense ecosystem um, in that community about who gets access, how those are, are printed, how the shopkeeper interacts. The fact that effectively he might be underwritten by WFP in terms of their relationship. Hey, I've suffered all this loss, the community's gained, but what are you going to do to, to sort me out? You could see a situation in which those beneficiaries who get access to what's validly entitled then becoming a focus rather than the shopkeeper and the WFP relationship. So somewhere that entitlement is, is going to be broken in, in a different way. It doesn't necessarily mean it's it's wrong in any sense. It's just it's going to take time to iron out some of those differences in those relationships. And likewise, with the climate colleague who's done, but you know, actually physically getting the stuff into place after an event, rather than assuming perhaps that that um, commodity is available if somebody comes with the, the QR code. And, and the concept of retracting a QR code after it's gone to somebody, again, is going to generate some really interesting political dynamics and, and a sophisticated way of, of trying to manipulate some of those potential disputes. Fascinating stuff. I had one question. Do you have a question? Yeah, oh, we have more questions. So is it okay? So one last round Um so this is blockchain makes a pretty compelling case right not just for aid but all types of money movements to become immutable and this record. Um, in your earlier slide, you said that the uh, World Economic Forum had predicted 10% of all assets will be on blockchain by 2027. Considering how quick electronification of money has happened since the 80s, it seems like a slow rate, no? What? That it would take us 11 years to get just 10% of assets. Whereas you guys seem to have so much momentum, it's a lot of countries are looking onto this. So what challenges are there, uh, are, or are you seeing that's contributing to the slower rate? So one of them, from our point of view, uh, what we don't touch is the name of Bitcoin. So we don't use Bitcoin at all. So we don't have any monetary value, we don't have any speculative value on our platform. We don't touch Bitcoin, so we use the taking blockchain, re-engineering it for ourselves, and offer these, these solutions and services for these aid organizations. I think when most people think of Bitcoin, they think of it as a speculative tool. So we think of Bitcoin and the blockchain as like the web on the internet. So I think for the reasons people don't really know the difference yet between Bitcoin and blockchain. So they think of blockchain, they think in terms of Bitcoin. And Bitcoin adoption has slowed down over the last year or two because the price has, has been stable. But your slide was about blockchain, right? So yeah. it, just talking about blockchain, not One the current. One of the biggest inhibitors, to be perfectly candid, is there is an enormous number of organizations that make an enormous amount of money out of these for things that don't cost anything. So banks, for example, make in the UK make about thirty percent of their profits from fees from things that don't cost anything. It costs a bank next to nothing to send a wire transfer. But yet they'll charge the customer 25 pounds or 25 dollars for that's pure profit. So if you all of a sudden come in and say we can do all that for free, you can imagine there's gonna be a lot of pushback. And so that is really one of the things that could use. As we meet with aid organizations, as we meet with NGOs and government agencies, they say, Well, when is all this going to be possible? Say, well, it's possible today. And then we'll do a demonstration and show them how to register somebody today. And I said, well, if this is possible, why why is this not everywhere? And again, it's, well, if you're a migrant who has family in Haiti, let's say you're living in Dublin and you want to send them cash, maybe you don't have a bank account. Maybe you are working cash in hand, you know, so you can't open a bank account. So where do you go to get money to your family? You have to go to Western Union that charges you 40, 
interest rate on your transaction. Or even just the very basic. Has anybody taken money out of an ATM recently? Typically, you get charged, what, two, three dollar fee? Well, if you're taking out a hundred dollars, that's three percent. It's not bad. If you're taking out ten dollars, you're now paying thirty percent service fee. To use that so we all get affected by it. And there's absolutely next to no cost in doing that. But there's an entire industry that's based around charging people for something that's really costly. So that's what that's really what we're facing. But the good news is, as more and more people are interacting with this technology, they're starting to realize, wow, I can send money for free. In fact, an individual that I worked on, my background is finance uh, and the investment world. An individual that I've worked with in the past was famous two and a half years ago for sending $147 million from one country to another for free. If he had gone through a traditional banking system, it would have cost them about six and a half million dollars to make that transaction. So that's the that's the you know the, the economies of scale that we're dealing with. And once people clue into that and realize, wow, I can send money for free, or I can send you know information or resources for near free, then the adoption rate is going to be very, very quick. So I think the 2027 figure is conservative, but I think that the adoption curve is going to go almost plateaued for maybe the first half of that and then just skyrocket. It will be like internet adoption. So even 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, a relatively small number of the population, global population, had email. Now most people have a Twitter handle and a Skype account. Too. So the adoption rate is going to be very, very fast and very, very quickly. Okay. Then I'll go ahead and I'll ask. Two things there. Firstly, uh, related to that, on the issue of uh, transactions to developing countries, etc. The one thing it seems nobody can ever stop being screwed on is exchange rates that banks charge. Like, I see no way around this. Sending dollars to Ireland that becomes euros, you get screwed by the bank. There's just how it is. Do you think this technology play any role at all in stopping that? Because there's the official exchange rate, exchange rate, and then this one gets screwed by the bank extra two percent. So I have a Bitcoin debit card. Um, so a few days ago I was in Italy, then I was in London, then I was in Ireland, now I'm here in New York. And there was a stop in Las Vegas in between there somewhere. I can't remember, it's all blurred. Right but I was able to use my Bitcoin debit card, which is underwritten by Visa. And I just got the official exchange rate everywhere. Because this coin was using Bitcoin as the underwriting asset. And so I wasn't subject to any overages or any exchange rate premiums on top of that. But here, you're right. Sometimes, I mean, there's there's ex exchange stores in the UK right now that even though the euro to pound is, I think it's 114, they're actually getting 99 pence to the euro because people are just getting ripped off. This technology can totally eliminate that today. It's already, I'm already using it. So that can be eliminated. All of these middlemen in fact, Western Union is a great example because there are already more, since 2009, which is only seven years, Western Union's been around for 140 years. Blockchain technology, there's already more blockchain transactions every day than there are Western Union transactions. So Western Union probably won't exist by the end of this decade because more and more people are going to say, I don't need to pay for this service. There's no, no value there, no value property. So that is a, a problem that will be solved very, very quickly. And that's part of the project we're doing in the UK and the Serbian government is because they say they want to control the flow of funds as opposed to using the rest of the world. And there's an economic incentive for governments because if instead of, you know, if somebody wants to send $100 to Haiti, but 40 of those dollars get captured in fees and overages, that's $40 that doesn't get to go into the economy and stimulate the economy and help create jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So the government's recognized that there just hasn't been the vehicle for transmission up until now. So I had a question, which is when you had when we had talked about the different registries, you said you can actually have your own registry. You know, the government can have a separate registry right within uh, within blockchain. And my question was, uh, one of the things that we do face as development organizations is. Um, you know, you may start off with humanitarian engagement, you know, with the Red Cross and the World Food Program, 
and UNDP, for example, our organization would come a little bit later in the development chain when they hand over, uh, for example. Um, and we were just wondering, in terms of those different registries, especially when it comes to people identification, um, how do you make sure that you don't have multiple identities cropping up and kind of where you're reinventing yourself or trying to game the system and say, actually, I'm Malika point two point oh today, you know, and, and access those benefits. So when somebody registers on the system, they get an identity, much in front of them. Everywhere you go, our goal would to be a transparency engine that aid organizations use across different borders. So when you're dealing with UNDP, dealing with the Red Cross, it's, it's, it's a path that we want to make for free that they can actually use as a standard to register people. So if they're going from getting aid from UNDP in one country and the Red Cross in another country, they don't need multiple IDs because if they have multiple identifications, you're not building a better profile. Right? And then that's kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, to to so prevent that, intentional fraud, though, like somebody who wants to have multiple mm -hmm. identities, like, I mean, we could implement a retina scan, we could implement a biometric reading, you know, things that can't be duplicated or, or associated with multiple. You know, it, it's as, it's like basic primary key for a database. You know, that there's one. I, I think my question was more that. So, say you have retina scan or a fingerprint in this registry. Because a government is unable to access it, because you know the next aid organization is often able to uh, not access it, or a, or a, an organization that provides benefits in Sweden is unable to access it because it's a closed registry to protect privacy. You know how do we, how, you know, what kind of data are you making available, and how? So you know, is is that more organization that needs to be done? And at this level, say, okay, we're going to provide access to this registry to only these organizations, and they apply for it. Is that very yeah, I mean, when we partner with different organizations, they'll come in and they will be able to access a particular view of the information. So they may say, you know what, here's here are the fields that we need to be able to see. Um, and then, you know, but but really that the registration should happen with the NGO or with the aid organization. Um, because they are going to want to oversee what information is being captured. And they're going to have a set of policies and procedures around data integrity and you know how, how they actually verify identity. Our goal again is not to not to tell them how to do their job, it's just to facilitate their job. So. That's wonderful. Thank you so so much. We've gotten so many requests online saying please share your presentation because I think they could see most of it, but no um, so that would be lovely. And thank you so much for making it. Thank you so much for coming in today morning. Um, if you have more questions with Joseph, his contact details yes. were up there, and we will send them around with the presentation. Um, the conversation is also going to be archived in case you want to uh, play through it. And if you want to sort of be on the mailing list for future innovation conversations, do let us know. Um, if you register here, we'll definitely keep you in mind. Thanks again. So much to digest. Yes. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm not going to get today.